If Judaism did not exist in the middle of the 20th century, it would have to be invented in order to meet some of the moral problems of our age, if indeed such a complex system could possibly be invented. I derive this conclusion from a consideration of the nature of our moral problems. They are different in character from any of those which confronted our ancestors before our time. In all previous ages, since the beginning of history, it was possible for parents to anticipate with some clarity the nature of the world with which their children would have to cope. Even though civilization was evolving, it was evolving at such a slow pace that it was not likely that the children would have to deal with completely unexpected situations. In our own age, this is no longer true. None of us can envisage in any way what the world is going to look like even 15 or 20 years from now. There is more progress being made in medicine, in science, in mathematics, and in technology in 10 or 15 years nowadays than was made in two or 3,000 years before our time. I remember very well the time when television was not even dreamed of. And I can remember, too, the time when after it had been dreamed of, everyone who was an expert in the field thought that it would be a failure as a competitor to the radio. I can very well remember the time when there were no automobiles. And I remember the great shock that I felt when some 40 years ago, a young woman asked me whether she could take me somewhere in her car. There were, of course, automobiles at that time, but I was a little surprised to find that a young woman owned a car of her own. Today, this is quite common. Only 20 years ago, when the United Nations was established, it was supposed that America and her allies would always be able to control the assembly. Nowadays, there are so many new nations that the power of control of the assembly has moved entirely out of our hands. I am told that in many nations, more than half the population is under 20, and they are the ones who make the political decisions. Certainly, this was never true in history before our time. I'm not speaking of the great inventions of atomic energy of proposed flights to the moon, of the possibility of going from New York to London in an hour and a half, of the bringing of the world together into a small neighborhood, of the probability that there will be shortly a billion Chinese and that the white people of the world will be outnumbered four or five to one, and that therefore, sooner or later, the hegemony of the world will be removed from Europe and America and be centered somewhere else on the planet. How is one to make decisions in a world which is so different from anything we have known, and how are parents to train their children to live in that kind of a world? How are children to decide what is right and what is wrong when no code of norms that we can provide can possibly be useful? since all the codes that we can think of deal with a world in which we live or in one very similar to it. Our condition would indeed be hopeless if there were not in our midst at least one people which has throughout its history had the necessity of making precisely such decisions for a generation which would almost certainly live in a totally different world. There may be other peoples whose history is similar to that of the Jews, but certainly the history of the Jews over the last 2,500 years has been one in which only rarely could parents anticipate what would happen to their children. And yet the parents were very eager that their children should reach the moral decisions and live moral lives. For example, if parents raised their children about the year 600 before the beginning of the Christian era in Jerusalem, many of them must have anticipated 
as the prophet Jeremiah warned them, that these very children would spend most of their lives as deportees in Babylonia, a very different country, and a country in which they would not possess arms, but would have to be workers and might even be slaves. Seventy years after their deportation, Cyrus the Great permitted a large part of the Jewish people to return to Israel. But these people had grown up in Babylonia, and their parents had taught them, doubtless, a normative ethic suitable to life in Babylonia as deportees. How were they to meet the challenge of pioneers in a country which had been deserted for 70 years and in which they had to meet a hostile environment among people who had seized their farms and were being dislocated in order to make room for them. Within a few generations, the Persians were ousted from their empire, which was taken by Alexander the Great. The civilization of the Greeks was very different from the civilization of the Persians, and the Jewish young man had to face a highly developed culture highly developed philosophy of a people with a great literature, great art, and great science. And how were parents to train their children to meet this challenge and still continue to make the kind of moral decisions that had been made by their ancestors? A short time after that, there occurred the only persecution in which the Greek people ever indulged for religious reasons, namely the persecutions of the Jews under Antiochus Epiphanes. No Jew could have anticipated this persecution or the effort to extirpate Judaism. Certainly no Jew would have anticipated that a small group of their people would undertake to make war on Antiochus, and although outnumbered, six or seven to one, would win the war and establish an independent Jewish state. For the first time in four centuries, the Jews were again independent, and young people now had to know how to live moral lives in their own state and in prosperity. For Judea had become prosperous in a manner quite unknown for many hundreds of years. But this Maccabean state lasted only a short time before Pompey destroyed it, and the Romans became governors of Judea. And then in the year 70 of the Christian era, Jerusalem was destroyed and many Jews were sold as slaves. What parent could provide his child in freedom with instruction for the morals of slavery? How could he teach him when the time had come to commit suicide in order to escape a fate which might be worse than death? Jews were sold in Rome for less than the price of a horse. But not only were they reduced to the very lowly state in which the maintenance of their morale must have been extremely difficult, they were now living in countries, the language of which they did not understand, in which they were a tiny minority, and in which they still had to maintain their moral fiber. Many Jews escaped to Babylonia, where there was still a Jewish community descended of those who had not been restored by Cyrus to Judea. This community lasted for many centuries. However, in the course of time, the great majority of Jews found themselves in northwestern Europe, in a climate and among peoples which were entirely new to them, and no moral code that could have been provided for them while they lived in the land of Israel or in Babylonia in later times, could have prepared the Jews for life in Western Europe, where sooner or later they were forced into the cities. Not only forced into the cities, but also kept out of almost every industry. During the 14th and 15th century, the Jews in Germany were expelled and readmitted, expelled and readmitted, expelled and readmitted, in a sort of cat and mouse game that was being played with them by each of the small states. Thus, no father could know whether his son would grow up in the city of his birth, or in the country in which he had been raised, or in distant Poland, or Russia.
And so throughout the history of our people, from the days of Jeremiah and even before, despite all this, there are still 11 million Jews in the world, and they have maintained a remarkable morale, intellectual, philanthropic, and humanitarian. It is amazing to think that so many of the Nobel Prize winners are of Jewish descent, of the role Jews play in American industry and in other industries. It is surprising to think of the manner in which Jewish youth as a whole give themselves to study and of the manner in which the Jewish home has been maintained. And Jewish philanthropy is, of course, flourishing as never before. Well, how did all this happen? This happened not because anybody provided their children with norms, because the norms would necessarily have been rejected. There were norms for ritual, doubtless, but the Jews for some 2,500 years have been concentrating on trying to develop in their children a capacity for moral judgment of their own. Moral judgment under conditions which the parents could not possibly anticipate. The father in Jerusalem, whose son or daughter was going to be a slave, taught his child not specific behavior, but that he could not do. But he taught his child how to arrive at a decision in a crisis. The manner in which the instruction was given to children is preserved in a great book, which we call the Talmud. The Talmud is an immense work consisting of 35 treatises in its Babylonian version and of a large number of treatises in its Palestinian version, which differs from that of the Babylonia. But both have this quality in common, namely that specific situations are constantly discussed precisely as a scientist discusses with his pupil a method of inquiry. Throughout the ages, the Jews were taught one principle, namely to make the study of the Bible and the Talmud their main business. Obviously, not everybody was intellectually equipped to pursue Talmudic studies, which are approximately as difficult as trying to understand Spinoza or Kant. But there are parts of the Talmud which even people with a low IQ can follow and which are nevertheless quite inspiring. And of course there is the prayer book, which contains a great deal, which is the epitome of the Talmud. And then there were the teachers who tried to explain to the children under their care what a Talmudic approach to a problem might be. And so throughout the ages, a Jewish child growing up in a Jewish home became imbued from the very beginning of his studies, from the time he could first begin to talk, in fact, with a need to reach moral judgments, and with a method for reaching moral judgments. In the small cities of Eastern Europe, which have now been destroyed, Jewishly speaking, about half the population always spent an hour or more after a day's work studying the Talmud and about a quarter of the population was expert in the Talmud, so that the ideal which Dr. Hutchins developed for the study of great books was realized in those communities to extent almost unknown. I say almost unknown because I'm not sure that it was entirely unknown. But I do not know of any other example of such adult education in the whole world. Well, is not this what humanity has to learn how to do today? Do we not have to have for mankind as a whole, not the Talmud of the Jews, of course, but that is specifically prepared for the need of that particular people, but a sort of world Talmud in which human problems, generally speaking, are analyzed by the same method which the Talmud analyzes the kind of problems which a Jew meets.
We have no desire, of course, to seek proselytes to Judaism. We know that the Christian religion is a very great religion. And Maimonides says that were it not for the Christian religion and Islam, the Bible would have been the monopoly of a few Jews and would have been unknown to the rest of the world. But we are living in a generation in which, for the first time, the Bible is no longer the bestseller. The best sellers in our time are the works of Karl Marx and Lenin, and we now have to meet a challenge which can only be met by introducing logical analyses of the problems which are likely to confront our children. I submit that in trying to work out such logical analyses, the experience of the Jews, unique in character, may turn out to be of immense importance, not only to themselves, but to mankind everywhere. About 30 or 40 years before the beginning of the Christian era, there lived in Jerusalem a great man whose name was Hillel. He was, in fact, the foremost figure in Talmudic Judaism. It is told that on one occasion, a young pagan came to him asking him to be converted to Judaism. But this pagan made the following condition, namely, that he be told what Judaism requires in the time that it could stand on one leg, that is, in one sentence. He had previously been to visit Hillel's famous colleague, Shammai, who had told him that this was impossible, that Judaism was a complex religion, and that one had to know its rituals, its commandments, and it would take some time to master them, and that only one who knew the commandments and the rituals and Jewish theology could become a Jew. I'm sorry to say that if this young pagan had come to me, I probably would have answered precisely as Shammai did. But Hillel was an extraordinary human being, one of the great teachers of all time, and possessed of enormous self-confidence. And so he said to this young pagan, fine, I'll tell you what Judaism is in one sentence. It is what you do not like, do not do to your neighbor. Everything else in Judaism is a commentary, or as we should say, a footnote, to this basic principle. And, Hillel continued, now go and study. This convert became a Jew. Now, what did Hillel mean by the summary of Judaism which he gave to the young pagan. There are many things that one does not like. For instance, some of us do not like black olives. Some of us do not like the movies. Some of us do not like the radio. Does this mean that we cannot permit other people to enjoy these things in our home? Or to take a more profound and difficult case. If one happens to be a judge and a convict is about to be sentenced for murder, must the judge refuse to sentence him because obviously the judge would not like to be executed himself? No. All this is included in what Hillel was talking about. Hillel said to the pagan, the rest is commentary. Go and study. In order to know what you must not do to your neighbor, you must know what you would not have done to yourself after giving the matter sufficient reflection. So in the case of this man convicted of murder, if he were a man given to reflection and had studied a great deal, if it were possible to consider that such a man would be convicted of murder, he might wish to be executed. Thus Socrates refused to escape his punishment because he knew that it was a great service to mankind 
to maintain the dignity of the law. Therefore, the judge, putting himself in the position of the convicted person, might say, yes, if I were in his position, knowing what I know now and having studied the matter, I would want to be punished in order to help maintain order and civilization. But Hillel was saying more than that. He was saying all of Judaism is commentary to this principle. This includes apparently such dogmas as believing in God, believing in the inspiration of the prophets, believing in the immortality of the soul, and all the rituals, like observing the Sabbath and observing the Jewish food laws and fasting on the Day of Atonement and prayer. Now it might seem to us that Hillel was derogating a great deal in Judaism to a mere footnote. But to Hillel, who was a great scholar, footnotes were very important. And when he said that something was a commentary, he did not mean that it was insignificant. On the contrary, it was very significant indeed. But nevertheless, everything in Judaism he held to be a commentary to the summary he gave to the pagan young man. The difference between a text and a commentary is this, that while a text without a commentary is still something, although not much, a commentary without a text is nothing. Therefore, a man may think he is observing the Sabbath or keeping the food laws or believing in God, but he may be deceiving himself. If he does not refrain from doing to his neighbor that which he does not want his neighbor to do to him, he is not really keeping the Sabbath or observing the food laws or believing in God at all. He is only pretending to do these things, doing them by rote, as it were. That is one of the purposes that Hillel had in mind in stressing this teaching to the young pagan. He had more in mind, however, when he said, go and study. It is not easy always to decide what is right. Anyone can understand that if one is in the presence of a disadvantaged person, one does not flaunt one's advantages. That does not require much study. However, situations arise which do require study. For example, suppose you were walking along the street and in front of you was a cripple in a wheelchair being moved along. It would be improper for you, obviously, to rush past him, reminding him of his handicap. But suppose you were late for work. It would be proper for you to refrain from rushing past him at the cost of your employer. This issue would require some reflection, and perhaps it would be best if you reflected on the subject before the issue arose. In fact, it would be best to reflect on many possible human situations before the issues arise. That is what Hillel meant, in part, by saying to the pagan, go and study. But one could ask Hillel, too, could one not? How can belief in God be a footnote to anything? Is not the belief in God the very foundation of all the foundations of religion as Maimonides, the great philosopher of the 12th century, held. Of course, belief in God is the foundation of all foundations in religion. For without that belief, you would not be likely to consider your neighbor as your brother. And the moment of temptation, you would not be likely to refrain from doing to him what you would not want him to do to you. On the other hand, if we say we believe in God, but do not love our neighbor, our belief is not worth much. The same is true of the belief in the inspiration of the prophets, or of the belief in the revelation of the Pentateuch, or of the belief in the miracles recorded in the Bible, or the belief in the immortality of the soul or, in fact, of the belief in all the dogmas 
that Judaism teaches. It is a little more difficult to see how Jewish rituals are related to the principle of not doing to your neighbor what you don't want him to do to you. But on reflection, the rituals too can be seen as footnotes to Hillel's principle. One goes to synagogue to pray. That is a ritual. However, in praying, one becomes aware of the fact that one's role in the world is transient and momentary, and how much one owes to God and to good fortune, and how little one really owes to oneself. And you also become conscious of the pathos of life, your own life and your neighbor's life, and you are less likely to do to him what you would not want him to do to you. The same is true of the various rules governing the Jewish home which Judaism regards as a sanctuary equal in holiness to the synagogue itself. The rituals associated with the Jewish home are varied, like kindling the Sabbath candles on Friday night before dusk, like observing a number of food laws, like observing the Jewish marriage laws and training one's children in Judaism. Each of these is a symbolic act full of meaning. All of them, according to Hillel, are an effort to persuade us and help us avoid doing to our neighbor what we don't want our neighbor to do to us. We do not live in a synagogue, but we do live in our home. And the more the home is spiritualized, the more likely we are to think of our neighbor with love and to refrain from doing to him what we don't want him to do to us and the more likely we are to raise our children in such a way that they will not do to their neighbors what they don't want their neighbors to do to them. All this, while simple, requires a great deal of study. And it was Hillel's contention, not only that it requires a great deal of study, but that the study process was even more important than the results of the study. Two people might come to two different conclusions with regard to the man I spoke of before who was late to work and who did not want to pass the person who was handicapped. But what would be important is not the conclusion to which they might come and about which equally wise people might disagree, but the reflective process the fact that they were taking life seriously and trying to do the right thing. This reflective process marks the cultivated and civilized person. Just as two poets might disagree as to which word ought to be used in a certain context, and in fact the person might disagree with himself and change his mind about which word would be the best word, so one may find two people disagreeing about what action ought to be taken under certain conditions and yet both be cultivated people. One can always tell the cultivated person from the uncultivated person by the fact that his choice comes after the liberation and not simply made out of hand. In order to know what is right, one cannot simply master and study present situations. One has to try to benefit by the vast accumulation of human experience. No doctor practices medicine as though there had never been any physicians before him. He tries to understand what all the doctors had learned before him and on the basis of what they had done tries to improve and bring medicine further. The same is true of people in every profession. This is also true in the great art and science of life. One has to look backward in order to go forward. As the late Professor Louis Ginsberg used to say, life is very much like a rowboat. In order to reach one's goal and to go in the proper direction, one has to look at the pier from which one has gone away. There is also something else, I think, that Hillel had in mind 
although it is not explicit in his comment. It was made explicit by a later sage who was a disciple of his disciples. That man's name was Ben Zoma. Ben Zoma used to say, who is a wise man? He who studies from everyone. Now you would normally think that a wise man is a man who goes around teaching people and is capable of giving instruction to other people. It was Ben Zoma's contention, however, that a man who goes around giving instruction to other people may or may not be wise. But a person who knows how to use the experience of every person in order to improve his own being certainly is a wise man to begin with and is going to be a wiser man as time goes on. Taking the words of Hillel together with those of Benzoma, perhaps we can arrive at an idea which would be very helpful to us in the troubled times in which we live. One cannot reach moral decisions without serious reflection, but one also cannot reach wise decisions without being willing to study from everyone. There is wisdom in Central Africa. There is wisdom in India. There is wisdom in China. There is wisdom in Christianity. There is wisdom in Islam. There is wisdom in Buddhism, in Hinduism. And there is also wisdom in Judaism. For centuries, these treasuries of wisdom have been locked off from one another so that in simpler times than our own, people, if they were saintly figures, tried to live by the wisdom of the men in their tradition. But in the more complicated world in which we are living today, faced with far more troublesome problems than our ancestors ever faced, I doubt whether we can solve our problems without garnering all the wisdom that is available everywhere. That is why it is so important to bring together the teachers of religion and the teachers of philosophy and the men of experience of all groups in order to garner from them all the experience and wisdom that they have to offer us. We at the seminary are trying to do something along these lines under the aegis of the Herbert H. Lehman Institute and the Institute for Religious and Social Studies. Similar activities are being conducted now in other parts of the world under the auspices of other great faiths. And one of the most remarkable developments of our time has been that of the Roman Catholic Ecumenical Council. With all this development, one has new hope for the future of mankind. And it is a comfort to a child of an ancient tradition which is held by only a small minority of the peoples of the world, that this wisdom was foreseen by two great men of his own faith, by Hillel and Benzoma.